well, we had the blessing of having Sri Swami Satsanananda with us in America from 1966 until he left the body in 2002. That's 36 years. I met him in 1969 at a well-known music festival called Woodstock. Uh, I would say that I was a, a convert to spiritual life in the sense that I, I had no upbringing in this lifetime with that. My parents never taught me anything. So like many converts, uh, I had a tendency to be extreme and fundamentalist in my approach when I discovered yoga. Two years after I met, met Gurudev in, at Woodstock, I dropped out of college. By some miracle, I got a conscious objector and my alternative service was to serve at first at the New York IYI, which was on West End Avenue, Manhattan at the time. And then uh, they sent me to Hartford, Connecticut. But somehow I, I've, I had this strong need to prove to myself mostly that I was genuine in this quest so whatever Swami Sasananda would say, I'm going to stop to call him Gurudev, uh, whatever Gurudev would say, I would try to follow to the T. So one day he talked about uh, one meal a day is a yogi, two meals a day is a bogey, someone who enjoys life, three meals a day is a rogi, someone gets sick. So I said, I'm going to be a yogi. And that was like 51 years ago. <laughs> I still... Eat that one meal a day. And I lost quite a bit of weight. Uh, I probably went from like 140 to like 104 in, in about a year or so. And uh, I had a more traditional relationship and vision of the guru. So when I see people come up and hug Gurudev, I, th I thought that's inappropriate. That's not the right thing. I would always bow down. But I think uh, uh, there, was, there was some lingering wish for me to get, get a hug one day. And, and uh, I remember one time he was leaving satsang and we usually line up and pronoun to him as he was leaving. And uh, he walked past me and then he walked back and said, you know, I'd really like to give you a hug. I said, oh, yeah, but, but you're so skinny. I think I'm going to cut myself on you. I said, oh, I don't think I'm that skinny, Gurudev. And he gave me this big hug. And I saw why people love those hugs. It was like something that really is so encompassing and soothing and filled with the awareness that everything is okay. And uh, pretty soon after the thing, moving to New York, I was sent to serve in Hartford, Connecticut. And one of the nice things about that was that Gurudev himself moved from Manhattan to Danbury, Connecticut. And I was at the closest center. So he would occasionally call up and say, uh, you want to come down with some people and do some karma yoga around the house? Yeah, yeah, good. We want to come. He said, okay, you're coming for karma yoga, right? Yeah, you're not coming to see me, you're coming to work. He said, yeah, yeah, no, good. We're coming to work. But he would always come out, work with us, and at the end, we have tea and cookies with him. And that was a sweetness that I really enjoyed. And there was one event that happened in Danbury that I think I'll never forget. It's pretty hard to put into words. Uh, I think you have to be there to get to be in my mind to kind of get it. But uh, he had a little small pond behind his house. And we're doing some work around the pond. And he was 
trimming a branch was on a rock that was jutting out into the pond, reaching over to trim a branch. And a little precarious, I'm doing my work. And then uh, I'm watching him through the cord on my eye and I see he's about to slip into and fall into the pond. And he looks over at me. <laughs> I'll never forget that look. Like he could see what was about to happen. I could see what was about to happen. We both were in sync. And there he goes, it's almost like in slow motion. He falls into the pond. And everyone goes, oh no, Gordon have fell into the pond. And he gets out, he gets out, he's all wet, he's a little sheepish. And he looks at me and nods and I'll never forget that. What it's like for an enlightened person to fall into a pond. You can't, you can't ever imagine what it's like. You have to kind of see that to believe it. And then uh, I remember saying to Gurudev that, you know, I, I need to spend more time with you. You know, if you're my guru, uh, I need to basically live with you. And he said, well, you know, if you find a place for us to live together on ashram, then maybe that could happen. In the meantime, he said, feel that any time you go to listen to my talk, feel I'm talking directly to you. So feel that way. But uh, I was, I helped find this place in Palm Tree Center, Connecticut. And we did end up buying that property with money that we, Carol King had given us property. We sold that property. And with that money, we bought this place in Connecticut. At that time, it was called Yogaville East. And I was stationed in Hartford. The, uh, the ashram was about maybe an hour and 10 minutes away. And one night, uh, it was a satsang night, I had to teach. And it was raining. So I taught my class, I get into the car, I start zooming out, I really don't want to miss the satsang. I'm not a great driver. It's raining, it's dark out. I'm not, nighttime is my best time to drive. Uh, and I'm speeding, and I get there, about a half hour late, I kind of elbow my way into the front of the room. And I start to do trotak on him. I'm gazing at him until the, my eyes start to peer. Then I close my eyes, I see him, I see the after image of him. And it, uh, it was something like, you know, I, I was a big West Side Story fan. I saw it maybe 10 times. So it was something like that scene where uh, Tony and Maria first see each other and everything goes into slow motion. Everyone else goes into fade. And there's just the two of them there. And that's how I was, just me and my guru. Everything else was faded out. And I went into an altered state. By some act of will, I, I was in some other state of consciousness. And I held on to that for the whole satsang. And at the end of the satsang, again, you know, we're pranaming. He looks at me and says, don't do that again. Stop that nonsense. Stop that nonsense, he said. Don't do that. Oh, okay. Uh, God is going to give you everything at the right time. Don't do that. So I, I held on to the feeling of, uh, of that, like I was being busted by him. But then I thought, you know, I thought, right. He said something very proud. God is going to give you everything at the right time. What a great message. I don't have to go crazy with my Mishagasa doing neurotic things. God is going to give you everything at the right time. I think that's, that's the universal message for all of us. I don't want to uh, just keep talking. Uh, maybe I'll pause after every few stories and see if anything I said evoked anything in you. Go ahead, Hansanaji. Well, 
Well, I just want to know what exactly happened after he got out of the pond dripping. <laughs> I mean, we thought that a spiritual master, does this, can a spiritual, a spiritual master fall into a pond? That, that doesn't seem possible. <laughs> but the, the, the sheepishness of his look, like he felt it almost like he, he felt guilty about it. <laughs> uh, yeah, he had run into the house. And you know how he comes out he immaculately dressed with his dote, wearing a dhoti. When he was in that environment, he only wore dhotis. Uh, he didn't dress in, in uh, Western clothes at all. I mean, he rarely wore, even his robe, he was just wearing a dhoti. So, and then he invited us all into the into the house. And I think everyone was embarrassed to bring it. No one said anything about it. But th there was some transmission there of, I saw, enlightened person fall into a pond and that enlightened person saw me seeing this and there was some <laughs> transmission there uh, that was unique that I think I, I never had since then. <laughs> and not to take all the time but what well, yeah. because I'm writing down the sentence you said God will give you what you need at the right time. What was that you said? Yes. Yeah. God will give you everything at the right time. Okay, thank you. God will give you everything at the right time. So, you know, I've tried to, that was 45 years ago or more, I've tried to somewhat live up to that. I still think that there's an individual who's going to crawl their way into some liberated state. But I, I think that Gradually, that message, it's taken a few decades, but gradually that message is starting to sink in. I think the clawing is, is necessary to recognize that you're not going to make it that way. <laughs> Until you recognize that, you're going to keep clawing <laughs> your way. I mean, there is such a thing as being too apathetic I think that's what I'm afraid of, is that I have other desires that are, take priority over this main one. And that's why I think I have to do something impressive. But that also is a problem. Uh, I think... God is more impressed by how much we can surrender than how much we can do. I remember, I remember once when uh, I, I guess I hadn't quite got to the message. This is maybe maybe fifteen years later. Uh, I, he was coming. He was he, I, he was in the parking lot. I think again it was Connecticut. Uh, yeah, Connecticut. And uh, I saw him at the car. He looked at me, he kind of looked me over and says, uh, no man, you're not, you're not trying. I said, oh, I, I mean, that's my main thing, trying, Gurdiv, you know, I'm trying. He says, no, no, you're not trying the right way, you're trying hard, you need to try soft. I said, try soft, <laughs> what, are, what the heck is that, try soft? You're trying in the wrong way. <laughs> I think that's what I'm saying is that, God is not impressed by trying hard. God is trying soft. It has to do with surrender. Trying soft, not a gritting the teeth. It's it's letting opening your fist into trying. How can I let go? Open up my fist. I'm used. To, I'm so used to my fists. I don't know what it's like to even start to do that. And he said when training, when teaching yoga, not to strain. Make it easy, not lazy. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I think there was always a part of this, as I mentioned, that there are, if I don't do it full force, then that's the proof that I'm not really 
interested in this. I don't know where, why. Well, I always did everything for, I was a swimming competitive swimmer. I worked harder than anybody. I didn't have much natural talent. I think that's my way to, to work like crazy, kind of be miserable. But I thought that's what it took. You have to be really miserable. I think I come from some Puritan background that if I suffer enough here, I'll get to the right, right side of God. Anyway, I'm here to tell you that that may not be the right way to go. Anyone else want to say anything? I got plenty of stories after all those years, but as I say, I want to also make this interactive. Okay, let's see what's next. Oh, was there someone? You can just unmute. Go ahead, Padma. Oh, yeah, no, I just like the way uh, Gurudev said to you, just feel that I'm talking to you alone, you know, directly to you as a way for you to feel closer to him. It had a real impact on me. Because, uh, you know, you listen to the lecture, you know, you hear him say things. I heard him say that before. Uh, but I, I, that's when I should do that uh, West Side Story thing. Trade out everyone else. He's just me and him. And he's giving a personal advice to me. And that, that did help. But luckily, I still felt we should find a place. And we found a place not too far from, from Hartford. Anybody else? Okay. So running these small centers, you end up doing yoga centers, you end up doing everything. You teach the classes, you vacuum the rugs, and then we use rugs and you had rugs and towels. Uh, you wash the towels, uh, you clean the toilet, you tell people who you advise people how to meditate, how to take enemas, everything you do, it all falls on you. And I felt that we had moved to, uh, from Hartford to New, uh, New Britain, Connecticut, and a working class place. It wasn't that much attention. We bought this church, so we thought it'd be a good place, but people weren't that interested in yoga. I ended up having to go out and get a job. But I felt that uh, running the yoga center uh, was keeping me from my practice. So uh, I thought the best thing I could do would be go, go back to school. I could think I'm a physical therapist. I thought maybe that could help my yoga. And I could get my own room. I could do my yoga practice. And I said, I decided that's, that's what I need to do. I told my dad, my dad was in Buddhist. I finally came to my senses. What is this ashram life? Uh, dropping out of college. Celibacy. Uh, he, he thought I was coming back to my senses. He said, I'll pay for everything. I'll come up with the money somehow. So I told Gurudev, I'm going to go back to school. Really? Yeah, yeah. Who's going to run the center? I said, good. Who am I? Am I indispensable? Oh, yeah. We need you to run the center. I said, what? And then he said something that, again, it's not that easy to convey. But you kind of have a thing you have to be there. He told a story. I've heard him tell it many times since then, but it was the first time I heard it. And all, all, probably all of you know the story. I'm sure I've heard it many, many times. Uh, it's uh, Guru says to his disciples, uh, it's, time, it's time for me to go. I'm going to go um, to heaven or where night people go when they pass away to Mahasamadhi. And I could take somebody with me. Who wants to come? 
And everybody kind of looks down. What? No one wants to come? Ram, what about you? Sir, I'm, I'm just finishing up my translation of the Bhagavad Gita. I, I would feel really incomplete if I left before then. Sambhashiva, what about you? Uh, sir, uh, I think I need to stay there uh, until my daughter is married. I think I need to have, have to see that she's okay first. So nobody is ready to go. And then there's a small voice in the back of the room. He hears something. What's that? Again, you come up. And first time, Magruder told me, first he said what the boy said in Tamil, so I definitely didn't know what you're talking about. And then he said it in English. He said, if I go, I may go. And the guru said, see, this boy who washes our clothes, this 11-year-old boy who washes our clothes, he knows more than all you folks. And, they, and they're like me saying, well, what did he say? What, is, what does it mean? I, I, I may go, it, it makes no sense. So go to this kind of piercing eyes at me. He said, if I go, I may go. I said, I have no idea what you're talking about. He says it again louder. If I go, I may go. I don't know what you're talking about, sir. He says it a third time, and I'm like almost crying now. I don't know what it means. He says, if the eye goes, then you can go. Adding all these degrees after your name will just give you more temperature. They won't really help you to go. And, you know, Hans Hans will know this, you know, there was a time when, when Guder was really encouraging us to go back to school. He says, you guys don't really know, know anything. How are you going to serve? You don't know anything. And he had encouraged us. So I thought he'd be happy with that. He said, no, it's just going to raise your temperature, more degrees. I, and even that pun, I didn't get right away. I was too nervous to even understand that pun. So... You don't think it'll help me? I thought I could do my yoga more. No. It's almost like that first message twice off. You know, if I go, then you can go. How do you get the eye to go? It's, it's a big story. I can't make the eye go. That's why he wants me to hang around. I thought I could get the eye to go properly. And he was saving me from that. <laughs> That's what the guru does. He saves you a few lifetimes of work. I would have, I would have gone back to school. Who knows what would have happened then? Next few lifetimes, <laughs> I'd be doing my yoga practice. I'd probably be up to 10, minutes, 10 hours of meditation a day after my third lifetime or so after that. And still in the eye would be as, as solid as ever. And then um, uh, when we moved to New Britain, that was 1973, we bought this place, uh, and I took pre-sanyas that year. Um, Sanaki, was that the year you took pre-sanyas also in 1973, first one? I think you took it before. It Wasn't there a West Coast on your pre-sanyas initiation first? Uh, you're, you're muted, Hamsanaki. Um, uh, February 73 was the first one on the West Coast. There were on the West Coast, 14 yeah. people. Yeah. yeah. Then he did it on the East Coast. Uh, I don't forget how many people, but I was so happy that I could, now I was in, he was starting, you know, we were just starting this order. We didn't have any monastic order. Uh, and I was so happy that I could be included in that. Uh, and so I took pre -sanyas. As I say, uh, in New Britain, there wasn't great attendance in yoga. So I got a job at a nursing home. I put my scarf in my pocket, my pre -sanyas scarf in my pocket. And actually, I was interested. <laughs> you know, uh, I, I got a first out of job in a welding place. You know, not, it was like a working class place. Uh, and I, I thought that I wasn't the greatest welder. And I either got fired or quit, I forget. But then I was looking at the one pages. And I saw under the women's section, there was a job for a nursing home. 
I said, well, I can't find anything. Maybe they'll take a man there. So I applied for that. And I came in and they said, yeah, that's great. Because it's a lot of lifting. You have to lift these heavy people. Sometimes they don't, they're not that light at that older age. You have to lift them out of bed, put them in a chair or a wheelchair or put them in a shower. So I got this job. I come back, run the center. I back in the rooms. And I stuck to my sadhana as best I can. Oh, yeah. Because I had this job, I couldn't do my noon meditation. But there was one thing that, I forget his name, maybe Henry. I think Henry would have to go to the bathroom before lunch, around 12. And he always had a hard time there. I'd hear him groaning and moaning in the bathroom. And that was my, he would take around 10, 15 minutes. And that was perfect for me. 108 times I could repeat my mantra. <laughs> well, he's phony and moaning. I'm home the Mashabai. <laughs> and I got, I just was, I was that type of uh, fanatic. I, I don't know if I keep, maybe I should quit this job. I can't do my new meditation. The Buddha came and gave a talk in, uh, in the Britain. And after the talk, Someone, I forget, Shanti was someone who was going to drive him back to Yogaville. Uh, they were getting the car, and it was just me and him in the room. Uh, I'm sitting, he's in a chair, I'm sitting at his feet, and I'm kind of nervous about that. And he's looking around the room, and then he, he settles his eyes on me, which, which I hope wasn't going to happen. And he's just gazing at me, he's not talking. And then he says, like, the most hurtful thing anyone could have said to me. But I put all my eggs in one basket, all my tofu in one plate, uh, which was meditation. So the words that came out of his mouth, these painful words, he came out was, you know, God's not interested in your meditation. I can't tell you what those words did to me. Mm. So I just, I kind of inwardly collapsed and just said, so what's God interested in? Well, where do you think God is? I said, Gerda, I don't know if you, you can probably tell, I'm like devastated now. I can't have a philosophical discussion with you now. I'm, I'm out of it. No, no, I'm not, I'm not picky on you. Just uh, let's just talk. Where, where do you think God is? And I, have, I don't know who God is. God is everywhere. He's everybody. He's all these names and forms. He wants to use you in service. And that really, I always cringe when he talked about karma yoga. That's that's not the real yoga. That's the people who can't sit down still. There he goes again. Every talk he would talk about it, and now we kind of zone out. So here he is. Now it's just me and him. Oh. He wants you to be of service, man. So I said. I, I don't know where I came up with this. I'm not trying to be a wise guy or anything. I just said, Gurudev, I go into a corner, I murmur some mantras, and I don't, I don't bother anybody. That's my service. In my state of mind, <laughs> that's what I offer the world, I'm not subjecting the world to my neuroses. Something like that, I said. And I saw he got excited. He was waiting for me to trip, trip me up. He was wanted to see. And he jumped all over that. He said, no, no, no. <laughs> You're not so kind-hearted that you're sitting in the corner, not serving by not disturbing others. That, that's, not, that's not what I'm doing. No, no, sir, that's not what you're doing. <laughs> You're afraid of being disturbed by the world. You're afraid of being disturbed by the world. 
You will never transcend anything you're afraid of. You will never transcend anything you're afraid of. And then Shanti came to pick him up. <laughs> and someone had to pick me off the floor. <laughs> That, I think, is, has been the main, out of everything he said to me, that might be the main one. You'll never transcend anything you're afraid of. Because I see this undercurrent. You know, I got the name of Shoka Nanda. Shoka is like worry, anxiety, sorrow. Ashoka, free from, Ananda, the bliss of being free from. So I have this samskara of being on edge. That's why I have to try so hard. I have to try hard. Uh, so there's that innate undercurrent of fear there. And I see, unless I deal with that, forget about God. I don't even have to worry about God, I don't think. I just have to worry about what's holding me, what's blocking the way. So I've done better. I mean, Gurdjieff have made sure that I stayed out prominent. My isolationist tendencies, which I attributed to as a sign of my positive spiritual introversion, he kind of kept poking at that, and that's that's not quite what it is. There might be some kind of introversion, but not necessarily a positive one. Some fear based there. Maybe I'll pause. This might be another place to pause. Anything resonated with you? or mm. Hopefully these aren't just lessons for me. I mean, there's no point in just sharing my lessons with you. Uh, that won't, hopefully that's not why you're here. You're also absorbing what I'm learning. Danny gives a thumbs up. <laughs> Go ahead, Amson. Amson on the, you always have the floor. Uh, you never have to think that uh, you're speaking too much, but you do have to unmute yourself. That's the one thing I require that you are unmute yourself. Well, I like other people to say <laughs> something, but yeah. But uh, when you said, I can't remember what you said. You just said it uh, that he said you'll never transcend fear anything you're much. afraid of. Yeah. Okay. So he said that. So then what? What did he? How were you to transcend if a? You see what I mean? What, yeah. What's the what's the good good what was he after that that you should do? Or I think for, first, or, just recognize, recognize that this timidity, this this sense of pulling away, the desire for isolation and solitude, I needed to really look at that and see how I thought I could avoid the lessons I needed to learn by being basically front and center in the world. And I think the first thing was just to be aware of things that I had told myself for my spiritual qualities that were also, there may have been some spiritual aspect to them, but there was also other aspects of them that I needed to see. And then whenever I would cringe, rather than withdraw, I would move, learn to move forward. Rather than back away, I would back away and then, okay, I'm backing away, move forward. Mm. And that is the work. That's the work. That's the work. And it's, uh, it's, uh, it's the hardest work. Sitting and repeating some mantra is not as hard. I mean, I, I, I don't think meditation is easy either. I mean, as someone meditating for so many decades, I still 
think meditation is not that easy. You bring the mind to a quiet state, or even to observe what the mind is doing, uh, it's not that easy. But what's really hard is to move forward when everything in you is telling you to back away. That and when, when we talk about you know what we're at, what we're trying to do, which we're trying to shift very deeply ingrained patterns, and I think meditation is crucial. But what Guru I've tried to make you understand is that you it won't be enough. You'll never get there, no matter how many hours you sit there. You won't get there. You've got to face your destiny out in the world. God is coming to you in the form of all these challenges. You want to know who God is? God is that person who is disrespecting you right now. God is that person who dislikes you. God is this untenable situation where you don't know how you're going to get out of it. That's, you want to know who God is? <laughs> That's where God is. Yeah. And, yeah. May I say Go ahead. David, go ahead. Yes, thank you. Um, I felt that for myself, um, you know, as you're saying about God is a situation that you cringe from and trying to be as abbreviated as I can. Um, I had a neighbor for the past two years. Um, and when I first saw the situation, it was a big disturbance for me because he was elderly, unable to care for himself and had, um, humpback forward flies, the kind that, you know, eat us when we, when the body is no longer in use and roaches and all these things because he couldn't take care of himself. And while nobody in the building or the management was willing to do anything, I felt like if not me, then who? So over the two years, you know, while it made me cringe and it cost me a lot of anxiety because a couple of the roaches began to visit me and the flies were visiting me and it was a big issue, but I took an interest and um, I was able to, through the grace of God, get him a cleaning service, clean the hoarding in his house um, that he paid for. But as the years went on, the past couple of years, I saw it was inevitable that he was going to fall because he could barely walk and he had a little poodle and I just couldn't see him dying in the apartment with nobody caring for him. So through the grace of God, you know, this situation turned out to be a beautiful blessing because three weeks ago, I checked on him when it was time for the cleaning and I saw the newspapers piling outside the door for three days and I found him lying on the floor. And um, he was still alive, thank God. So with that said, um, he was taken to the hospital. He's now in rehab. His daughter came back into his life that was strange for five years. Um, my girlfriend and I saved a little poodle. Oh, beautiful. It was very beautiful. And so, you know, through this, I mean, it was just such a blessing to save a life. And of course, it wasn't really just me. You know, that was God working through me and all the doctors and the EMT. But it was just so beautiful that now he's being transferred to a place where he'll have company and social activity. And, you know, from that, there's like all these learning experiences because now he was fine. Um, he asked me to watch his poodle and my girlfriend loved the dog. So she had him and really did not want to give him up. And then three weeks later, the daughter said, I want the dog. So, again, from a spiritual perspective, because, you know, I was thinking of the reason not to give her the dog back because my girlfriend wanted the dog and we paid for the vet bills. But yeah. really, um, because she insisted on having the dog and she didn't want to pay the vet bills. But <laughs> I said, no problem. You know, you can have the dog. Um, thinking the dog would be a connection back to her dad. And so I'm befriending her. This is his daughter. And, you know, um, so it's kind of beautiful that my judgment, how disgusting of her, you know, to not want to pay the $331 and demand the dog back. But, you know, what I, I cringe at a human being behaving that way. But yet, you know, God led me to say, okay, no worries, you get the money, you can have the dog. And if ever 
you know, your dad transitions and you don't want the poodle, please return the poodle to, to me and my friend Judy. So, you know, this was all like, it's all like Gurudev or the spirit working through me against my own nature. And there's a lot of beauty, you know, getting to know this person and seeing the good in her. And that's the only way that maybe we'll get the dog back. But it's like really just by being kind and generous. So these things that seem like a curse, you know, with roaches, which was my horrible fear, having these visitors and the flies, it just became an opportunity to make a difference for everybody in the building, you know, and, and also to save a life. I mean, whoever thought that that was going to happen. So, you know, um, at any rate, I think that it was just all of those fears and anxieties and anger. It just was an opportunity that I think that God was using me to be the one to be graceful and compassionate to this gentleman. So now he can be with other people and have social activity. And the dog does have a good home with the daughter. Mm -hmm. Maybe he'll come back, maybe not. But um, just the things that would normally make me cringe just allowed me through the grace of God to open my heart and have compassion and be the one and not allow something horrible to happen, you know, by being lazy or selfish. Thank you so much for being a channel like that. So beautiful. Thank you, baby. Thank you. Someone else have a hand raised? Yeah, me? Can I say something? Go ahead, yeah. It might have to do with my own upbringing, but that moment when Gurudev um, directed you toward not going to school to study physical therapy, because you had just recently expressed it to your dad and he was really, really excited about it. Was there, yeah. How did you resolve that? Like, to go back to your father and say, you know, I'm following Guru. I don't know if you, don't know if you did that or not. I imagine that could have been, at least I imagine it could have been a difficult situation. I see if I remember how my dad reacted. <laughs> he wasn't happy. He accepted. And, uh, he was starting to see that, you know, I, one, I wasn't crazy. And two, I was starting to get happier than him. And that's that made a big shift in him. I was never what I would call a happy person. Uh, 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 he saw that I was, something was happening. So, you know, when I took sannyas, I did, I did go to both my mom and dad and ask for their blessing. They didn't know what that meant, but I, I knew what it meant. And, and I felt if I'm going to move in this direction, monastic life. I, I want the blessing of my parents. And they both, my mom always had, I always had her blessing. But my dad also gave me the blessing. So he would have preferred, I mean, now he's just so proud of his son. He, you're happier than me. What else more? What, what else could a dad want? You know, so, uh, uh, but he had reasonable concerns in the beginning. Go ahead, Danny. Is that, did I respond okay, Mahadev? Do you, do you that answer your question? Yeah, it does. It definitely does. Okay. Yes. Mm -hmm. Danny? Oh, you're muted, Danny. <clears throat> Danny, you're muted. Okay, bye. Couldn't mm -hmm. find the button to raise a hand. Uh, okay. But I am, um, I'm, I was 13 in 1969, but you and I, rode the bus together um, from the Lotus once, and you only briefly mentioned that you were at Woodstock with Gurudev. And I am um, a student of history, and one of my interests is uh, the Woodstock 1969 festival. And so I wonder if you could tell me anything from your recollections. I know that Gurudev opened Woodstock and set a tone something that fascinates me about the Woodstock concert is it was never equal in its peaceful intent. And um, I guess I, while I have you here, I'd okay. like to ask uh, what, rec what memory you have of being with him or of uh, the vibe of that um, yeah. time. Yeah, I think I was 16. 
me and my friend, he had a license. He would drive, but we had to leave the car like a few miles away. You couldn't, you couldn't drive up to the Woodstock at a certain point. And we didn't have any tickets. We just walked in. I guess nobody had any tickets at that point. They were expecting like 30,000 people, there were 500,000 people. And, you know, I'm this kid from Flushing, Queens, New York. I had long hair then. I thought I was somewhat of a hippie in terms of Flushing, Queens standards. But I saw, I, I saw people who, I don't know, because I don't know where, I saw these people from the hog farm, at the big bus called Hog Farm. And I don't know where they, how they did it, but they started cooking for people. Because the, the, the vendors, they ran out of food like in an hour. I don't know where they got this food from. Uh, they started and serving meal and with such pleasure, such joy. And I said, okay, that's a hippie. I'm not like the suburban hippies. Uh, those are, that's the real thing. And then when Gurdjieff came on the stage, uh, I had been taking some psychedelic drugs before, but uh, I think it was the first time I actually took LSD, like most of us there. And I was having a very unusual experience. Not scary, but something I wasn't used to. And then I start hearing him talking. And it just, I just settled into the, the sound of his voice. I don't know if I even understood the words. Sound of his waiter, you know, I listened to the words, you know. America is at the forefront of many things, but now it's time to be in the forefront of spirituality. Music is a beautiful way there. Um, but at the time, I don't remember that what he said. I just remember feeling that washed over me. It took me a year and a half to get under, into his fold. But, uh, and uh, yeah, it was, uh, it was an amazing scene. It rained quite a bit. We were in the mud. And, and yeah, I think... I think you couldn't duplicate that. The energy was just so harmonious. So we've had so much good toward each other. I know they did Woodstock 2, Woodstock 3. They were like, not good. There was something about the time. Gruda was brought to America just at this time. Uh, the music, the where, where the conscience was shifting. With some type of perfect storm that happened, and Woodstock was a culmination of that, I think. And it pulled me, you know, and many other people in a certain direction. But it was hard also, you know, to go to the bathroom, you know, to walk. You, know, you couldn't really walk. You had to climb over people. The bathroom is like a mile away. And you really got to go, you know. <laughs> So it was, it was, it was challenging also, but so much goodwill, so much good energy. Was any, was any else there besides me? I'm probably the oldest one here. Oh, I'm so not so old. Yeah, Danny. So you knew of him from Woodstock, but you met him later. You yeah. knew that it had been him at Woodstock and uh, we were uh, having trouble logging in, so maybe I missed it. But what was your first meeting with him? And you knew at that time that uh, you'd seen him at Woodstock, which is a monumental event, in my opinion, for the reasons you, you mentioned. Yeah. When did you first meet him, and how did that happen? I was going to uh, State University at Binghamton, Harper College, Binghamton, New York. And I started getting interested in yoga. And I, I looked in the yellow pages. There wasn't many yoga, much 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 yoga in New York, 1970. So the biggest ad was integral yoga. There were like two other ads, the biggest one integral yoga. So I started going, I would hitchhike down from a five hour to hitchhike down from Binghamton, New York, New York City. I stay with my mom. And I take yoga class, I said, oh, that's, I saw that person. That's the man from Woodstock. And then um, 
And then I started, he started having, he had lectures at, uh, get the name of the church. And I started going to those lectures. And I think that's all I want to talk about that. I, there's a few stories around that, but uh, I think, I think I'll stop there. But uh, thank you, Danny, for bringing me back to that early days. Yeah, thank you, Danny. Uh, Mudita, am I pronouncing your name, Mudita? Yeah, Mudita. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Um, thank you for sharing all your stories about when Gurudev was here. Um, I was just wondering if you had any stories about your connection with him after he left the body. What's your relationship with Gurudev like now? That's important. Where are you calling from, Gita? Where, where, where do you live? I live in Southern Illinois. Okay. Far wow. away from Yogaville. Okay. Uh, Good of that the day Good have left the body. I was it was the first day of advanced teacher training. And the then Swami Sevananda, Hamsananda Jyoti Manohim, came in to uh, say, I'm sorry to interrupt. I have some very hard news. You would have just left the body. So you kind of go into shock. I have these, uh, like 20 people there. And I say, all right, uh, uh, let me, I started teaching again. <laughs> and said, you don't understand, you're the president. <laughs> ATP is over. <laughs> you, need to, you need to start thinking about what's next. Oh, I, I couldn't wrap my mind, mind around that. I don't remember being devastated. I, I saw some people really we were not in good shape that night. And following months, you know, I don't remember that. I, what happened was we, we, uh, we had a, a big gathering, about 3,000 people. To bring Gurdjieff's body into um, the dumb room. And I remember the... The weeks leading up to that, he did something to me. And it's hard to put into words. Just try to imagine, you're someone who tends to worry. And all of a sudden, I can't remember how to worry. I don't remember what worry is. Everything's unfolding. I can't, what's, why would I worry? Now that's not me. That now how could that be? But there's so much to be done. Everything is in motion, and yeah, it's it's. Uh, I I have some role in this. I'll I'll play my role, and I'll kind of watch it unfold. That was, I think, that I'll never stop being grateful for that grace because I got a, a touch of what it's a kind of. I guess it's kind of samadhi where the mind is just, you recognize it's unfolding, it's you're in the flow. I couldn't hold on to that, but I'll always be grateful for that. And um, I mean, Gurudev did his best to make sure we understood that it's not going anywhere. And I think I, I really internalized that. I went back to that thing, of, you know, thing about, you know, why would you hug the guru? You know, I, I understood that, that that's not him. That's that body you're hugging is not him. I have great reverence for that body and the personality that lived in that body. But that, I don't think that's the ultimate guru. So... 
I feel that I, I feel more connected to him than I ever felt, even when he was in the body. I feel his presence more in my life. I feel as something's happening, I'm backing off. I feel his love saying, okay, it's okay. Move forward, you'll be okay. Without feeling that love, I would, I would still be overpowered by my son's scars. But that love says, no, it's okay. We got this, we got this together. And you know, before the pandemic, I was doing a lot of traveling, almost half time. And traveling, you know, you're in a strange country, they, they don't, you don't speak the language, your host hasn't picked you up. Half hour passes, an hour passes. Uh, there's always, you miss a flight, you're waiting for the airport, you don't know how to use a phone. You don't even excuse the phone, you can't speak the language. Uh, all these things happening. But I, what, what I would do is I'd carry my luggage in my left hand and I'd hold Gurudev's hand as I'm walking through the airport in my right hand. You don't want to hold the guru with your left hand according to Indian custom. So I would always walk with Gurudev wherever I go. I mean, hopefully now I'm not totally disconnected from him. I, I, I am a little bit full of myself, but I'm trying to feel also that there's something more than Swami Shokananda happening now. Like when I, I don't do a lot of driving anymore, but when I drive by myself, uh, I'll buckle the passenger seat. And I'm not a great driver, as I told you. And now I'm chauffeuring God, a guru. And, and now I should slow down, be more careful. And I put Gurudev to bed every night. I have a little blanket. And put, even though I'll be 70 this year, I still like those rituals. Of, uh, I, I, I cover him and say my prayers to him in the morning. The first thing I do is I uncover him, say my prayers for the day. So in those ways, hopefully many more, mostly to the mantra, uh, he's more alive for me than ever. And I really try to understand that the, the guru, the mantra, and, this, and, the, and the, the true self are not three separate entities. So you probably are too young to ever have met him, uh, Mudita, but uh, you have no need to feel uh, a, a lack of connection. Um, I, I agree that there, there is some, we had some blessing to have been in his presence all those years, but you may be more advanced than me uh, in your pure heartedness, you know, uh, uh, and you may not, you may not have needed that. I probably needed to be in that presence. You may have that purity of heart already without that. Well, I don't know if I have that, but I, I also do feel good at that so strongly. And I think yes. in large part due to you and the other Swamis. Okay. Thank That's you. beautiful. Yeah. I, I, I'm always impressed. This few days ago, I initiated somebody. I'm on initiation. I'm always impressed. People still coming forward and saying, oh, yeah, yeah. I feel that connection to him. Uh, I want to make this commitment. Yeah. So uh, I was supposed to go to uh, 8.45, but we started late. Uh, if you can stay, I'll go to 9 o'clock. Does that, that seem okay? Uh, anyone needs to leave, please we go when you need to go. Let me see what else. If there's anything else I really want to share and not, not miss out on. But one thing that uh, Hamsa Nanda will remember is that... Uh, that first my sannyas initiation, 1975, 27 of us, the first initiation into sannyas, the holy order of sannyas, Amsananda and I are one of uh, are two of seven people who, and the 27 who are still sannyasis. Um, and Amsananda remember this, uh, after the initiation, where I can't tell you our state of mind, we're like, so, in another realm, head shaved. We have our first time we're wearing our orange clothes. Where, what? what a feeling! 
Samyasin Bull. And Gerda said at the end, you know, okay, you guys are all elated now. It's not going to be this way always. So now's the time when you leave here, go down, go home and write down why you've chosen this path. What it means to you, what you're, what you're giving up to tread this path. Get a clear understanding of what you're doing. Write it down and read it regularly. And that was such great advice to me. I, I took a James Taylor song that I liked and I put down my affirmation to that tune. And I said, I want to say, I want to sing this affirmation regularly. And I thought, well, I'm pretty good at showering. So every day in the shower, I'm going to sing this, my sannyas affirmation to James Taylor tune. That was 75. I missed a few showers. Mostly I shower every day. Uh, and over those decades, I may have tweaked it slightly because I want every word to resonate. As I'm saying each word, I'm trying to see, does that, is that true for you? Is that true? And I tweaked it, but it's mostly basically the same thing I wrote down in 75. And uh, I'm not going to tell it to you. It's more private. But and he later said, you know, at, you know, for marriage, same thing, you know, uh, all right, you're in love. You're smitten with this person. It's not going to stay that way. Things that were cute now kind of irritate you. Remember why you did this. And that, I think, is singing that song in the shower 365 days a year for the last, I don't know, 46 years uh, has, I think, is the reason I'm here, so I'm shook under. After that, I was asked to go to New York City. Like I say, he kind of wanted me to be in the sick of things. I had this, uh, I forget who it was. Some lady said, I'm leaving the country for a fairly long time. You can have my, my house in the country. I thought like two, two or three years, something like that. I, I can't believe it. Thank you, Gerda. I went to Guru and he said, uh, you be by yourself for three years? He, wasn't, he didn't say no, but he didn't give it any energy. And then shortly after that, I was sent to New York City, like the exact opposite thing. <laughs> now I'm in New York. And they would tease me. I, I was this strange fellow. <laughs> Because they, they were by, there were about 12 sannyasins at New York at that time. And I was the most adamant about my meditation. And I was known as the, as the person who would, who would always sharpen his razor but would never shave. Guru would tell the story about <laughs> he dropping the razor so he would shave, man. To say, oh, the Swami's sharp, so sharp on his razor. What is he going to shave? <laughs> I still didn't quite get the common yoga thing. And um, only in charge, I would call him a good friend. I was a little bit unhappy because um, I was brother of Avekan. My priest on your days, I was brother of Avekan. So I was looking forward to becoming Swami Avekananda, the great Swami Avekananda. So he's giving out the names. And this other priest and Yasi gets his name, Swami Vikananda. I said, what? That's not, the, that's not the right thing. And then 
<laughs> Spike turn. Something sure can What? What's that? I felt slighted. Well, bro, I recognize this perfect group. So this Swami Vikananda, we became friends, but he was, Hamsan knows it, but he was a very charismatic man, very handsome, very capable. He was in charge. The ladies loved him. The men loved him. Very serviceable man. And yeah, I wasn't at that level of charisma for sure. I was trying to get charismatic, but it's working so hard. <laughs> so one day we, went, we all went up to the Connecticut Ashram. I think we're a three and a half hour drive. And it's a beautiful day. And we're out in the back lawn, big lawn. And Swami Vikanand is like holding court. All these people are around him. Backed by his magnetism. No one seems to be around Swami Shogananda. And, you know, I was in the competitive swimming world before I got into yoga. And I see that some of that, that a little bit, maybe not so little bit, that competitive samskara got stuck in me. Maybe it was always there. So even though with a friend I felt this, someone who I couldn't quite match and felt some jealousy and competition. And I saw these thoughts, I go, Ugh, what kind of swami are you? And then Gurudev came out and then I felt doubly bad. Oh, now Gurudev's here and he sees me sulking because my mind is so dirty. And then um, Gurdjieff calls out something. I can't hear what he says. I kind of went to the side. I couldn't hear what he said. And then he starts kind of marching in my direction. I noticed like the, the energy of his walk. And he shouts that thing again. I can't quite hear him. And then he says it again. I can, I can hear him. He says, you're the king in your own area. And everyone gathers around. The whole ashram is around. As good. it looks like he's, he's uh, reprimanding me. And everyone wants to watch some get reprimanded. He says, you're the king in your own area. There's no other Swami Shokananda. There's no one who can take Swami Shokananda's place. You understand that? First, I didn't know what he meant. He first he just said, you're the king of your own area. I actually didn't know he was talking to me at first. And then I realized he's talking to me. Then it started sinking in. No one else could be sorry, Shokananda. There's no other Swami Shokananda in this world. And I'll just describe and try to put into words what happened next. The ground opened up. I fell into it. My heart burst and I started crying in the bushes. I, couldn't, I didn't matter that I was surrounded by all these people. Uh, I don't remember being embarrassed. I just, I just cry like I never cried in my life. And when I would somewhat calm down, Gruta said, You see, there were some kids there, like five, six year old kids. See, these kids, they also uh, get negative jealousy, things, but then they, they don't give much energy to that, then they still they play with each other. Don't worry about your negative emotions. Don't give them so much energy. Uh, I would never say that 
at that moment, jealousy and competition never came up again, but it never came up in the same way again. I mean, I was always aware of it and saying, okay, don't see that. But that, it's one of those, you know, overcoming a deeply seated scar is almost impossible to do like that. It usually takes sometimes lifetimes of work, but under the right circumstances, a certain grace can happen. And something broke in me that needed to break. Five minutes left. All right, rest story. Some of you have heard this before. It's one of my favorites. So now I'm stationed in New York City. After 9-11, uh, Gurudev didn't want me to be, uh, by then I was like the only Swami here. Gurudev didn't want me to be alone here. So he sent Ramananda and Swami Givinanda to New York. And uh, Gurudev, I, I think he was going to give some talk. Ramananda and I were in the back seat. And now Reverend Shankar Fern was the driver. Gurudev was in the passenger seat. And Ramananda and I have been talking about this for a while. You know, we've been reading Buddhist texts and things, and we, and we said, you know, we need to meditate more. I mean, I always had that inclination anyway. But, you know, the three meditations a day in New York, or in any of his ashrams, are, are they're not that much silent time. We do chanting, pranayama, not that much silent time. So Ramananda said, we're going to spend more time in silent meditation. And we agreed with Telgaridev. So Ramana kind of nudges me, now, now's a good time, tell, tell him what we're going to do. I said, Gurudev, uh, Ramanji and I, we decided we're going to increase our meditation time. Uh, I think I just said that. And he didn't respond. So I thought, oh, he's on the way to a talk. Uh, maybe he wants some quiet time to himself. Ramanji nudges me again. Uh, so that's a good thing, because I didn't ask a question. Maybe I need to ask a question. So that's a good thing, right, Gurudev, that uh, we're going to spend more time in meditation. He didn't say anything. I said, okay, that's that's the sign that he's, he's going, preparing for his talk. But about 10 minutes pass. Yeah, memory is a funny thing, but this I remember. About 10 minutes pass. He said, I tried that. I, I don't think that's the way. I almost forgot what he's talking about. What? But then you stay all night in uh, Pirot Temple. Yeah, I did all those things. That's what I'm telling you. But the Buddhists, they talk about meditating like 10 hours a day. I was thinking of going to Bari, Massachusetts and joining them with the Pasana sitting. Uh, we could try it. I don't think, I don't think it's going to work. And he says, uh, do you enjoy what you're doing? I'm thinking, why is he changing the subject? Uh, I, I mean, there's mostly, there, I probably 80% of I enjoy what I'm doing. No, that's not enough. I said, there, you know, I have to ask people to leave the ashram, have to fire people. You can enjoy that also. You're helping them to do, to move to the right next place. Learn to enjoy that. Something like, look to David, you're helping him to move to the right place. <laughs> enjoy what you're doing. Stick to the three meditations. You'll be okay. I said, good, you know, we're not talking about becoming more peaceful. We were talking about enlightenment. We want to become Jiva Muktas like you. I understand. We're talking about enlightenment. You know what you're doing and stick to the three meditations again. For you, of course, you know, I, I chose this life. Three meditations, they may not be reasonable. But, but the message is there's a way to, even in this difficult, challenging time, there's a way to keep the mind 
there's a certain, you know, I'm reading, uh, I'm reading this book, Book of Joy, uh, the Dalai Lama and Desmond Tutu. These guys have suffered like more than you and I can suffer in so many lifetimes. But when they're, they're together, their joy, the joy that comes out from some deeper place, when he says enjoy what you're doing, it doesn't mean that there are tasks that aren't inherently that enjoyable. But there's a place you can, you can find in yourself. Find that place. Act from there. And stick to your meditations. For you, it might be once a day. It could even be five minutes a day. Uh, how much you meditate is not important. You just have a routine. And whatever you're facing in life, trust that it's, it's right where you're supposed to be, exactly where you are supposed to be to learn what you have to learn. And especially the, 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 the difficult parts of it. It's, you know, it's, it's such a, how can I say it? I, I don't know if this is not the right word. It's such a huge task to transcend the illusion of separateness. It's so deeply ingrained that you're this box on Zoom I'm a different box on Zoom. Everyone else, they have their name, they have their form. That's them. It's to feel that underlying interpenetrating consciousness that pervades all these boxes and everyone is not in the box. I think the only way it's possible is through outside the comfort zone. It's like seeing the roaches and knocking on the neighbor's door and seeing if I can help this man. Uh, it's outside the comfort zone. And the only way I can survive outside the comfort zone is if I feel that connection to my guru and that love and that wind at my back. Otherwise, I, I prefer comfort, man. Ah. Uh, I'm not a masochist. Uh, I like being comfortable. But I can't always be comfortable. When I get off the Zoom, I'm probably going to read some email that's going to go, how dare they talk to me that way? I got an email yesterday. I got so angry at this person. I was really thinking bad thoughts about this person. And then... I read the email even more carefully. He didn't say that at all. I misread the email. I said, wow, I, I can show my diary. I wrote my diary just before this. Wow, you have some real work to do, brother. What a great thing that you misread that email. You had that strong negative energy coming out. So... I think that will leave you with that message. Uh, get comfortable outside that comfort zone through some interconnection and faith and surrender. That's what I'm trying to do. I'm still a baby on this path, and I'm okay with that. Whatever. I'm not driving myself crazy anymore. Uh, I'm gonna enjoy the journey. That's so I stick it to the ego. I, it's not gonna, I'm not gonna let it drive me crazy anymore. I'm gonna enjoy the journey. Good closing chat. Mit your mom, with 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 your m
Shanti, Shanti, Shanti. Lead us from unreal to real. Lead us from darkness to the light. Lead us from the fear of death to knowledge of immortality. Om Shanti, Shanti, Shanti. Loka Samasta Sukino Bhavantu. May the entire universe be filled with peace and joy, love and light. May the light of truth overcome all darkness, victory to that light. Jai Shri Sakamaraj Ki Jai.